During the first years of the 1900s, the Zeppelin company built a series of airliners after years of disappointment in regards to military orders. While Zeppelin himself railed against using his creation for commercial purposes, he was outvoted by the board. And the Deutsche Luftschiffarts AG Engelschaft was founded. The German airship company, after a very rough start with its sole airliner, Deutschland, would go on to acquire a fleet of four ships which began regular flights across the nation. This was the first airline in history and would go on to build a reputation for safety and comfort. By the start of the 1914 season, DALAG was an international sensation and in Germany a technological achievement of immense pride. These regional flights would ensure the airships were seen over and around most of Germany's largest cities. What was once a curiosity that rarely strayed from the Bodensee where the first airships flew was now a common sight for millions, one that stirred both patriotic fervor and a curiosity and optimism for what the future held. While a relatively small proportion of Germans would ever fly aboard these airships, they drew massive crowds around the cities they visited and at the sheds where they were stored. While the Schwaben would be badly damaged by a fire, the remaining three airships would go on their regional flights between the cities which had built facilities to host the airliners. Sadly, it was not to last, as the entire enterprise was cut short by the Great War, and the airships themselves were turned over to the military during the period of general mobilization. Practically overnight, the ALRG had ceased to exist. The war would see Zeppelin's airships developed further, though to a much darker end. New streamlined hull forms allowed them to reach higher speeds, more efficient engines extended their range and increased surface ceilings, and fabric waterproofing would allow them to operate in poor weather. For all these advancements, the Zeppelin became known as a weapon of terror as they wrote havoc across cities in England and France. This newfound reputation would collapse airship production and design in Germany, as the state was subsequently banned from operating large airships. Most of their Zeppelins were turned over to the Allies or destroyed by their crews. Without their primary customer and more or less totally banned from building their main product, the Zeppelin company was seemingly at the end of the line. Its general manager, Alfred Goldsmann, attempted to pivot the enterprise away from airships towards car and consumer goods, regardless of the anger from the true believers in the firm. However, the economic crisis that emerged in Germany after the war rendered the plan hopeless. There would one day be a market for luxury Maybach cars, but it was very far off. A brief power struggle in the company ensued, with DALAG chief Dr. Eckener becoming its head over the firebrand Captain Lehmann, who had taken part in destroying several Navy airships which were to be turned over to the Allies. Dr. Eckener found a loophole in the treaty which was threatening to destroy the company. While Germany was not allowed to possess an airship, the Versailles Treaty did not explicitly prevent any private enterprise from building or operating airships of their own. With this in mind, Eckenar approached Chief Engineer Friedrich Dürr and his engineer to design a new airship, one which could in no way be used for military purposes and skirt through the Versailles Treaty. Thus, it seemed that the ALRG was poised to return almost as suddenly as he had vanished back in 1914. Initially, there were plans for a transatlantic airliner based on a massive wartime X-class airship, but its proximity to a military design was too problematic, not to mention expensive. They accordingly settled on a small design with regional ambitions. The design work for LZ-120 Bodensee, named for the lake from which the first Zeppelin flew, was completed on March 10, 1919, and first flew that August. Bodensee was built with a number of new design features which had become commonplace during the war. Chief among these were its teardrop shape which cut down on drag while retaining a large hydrogen capacity and its cruciform tail section which improved stability and maneuverability. Despite having roughly the same hydrogen capacity as the pre-war Saxon, Bodensee boasted a much higher top speed and lifting capacity, all while being considerably shorter. Its design was the most efficient of any airship built up to that point, 
as despite being considerably shorter than the airliners that preceded it at around 120 meters, it possessed an incredible useful lift of 44.5 metric tons and had a trial speed of 132 kilometers per hour. It was carried along by its four 245 horsepower Maybach MP4A engines, themselves surplus from the Great War. Perhaps most impressively of all, it could fly in all but the worst weather and could thus commit to a strict schedule. When fitted out for service, it was laid out in a manner similar to a passenger train within the combined cabin and control car. It possessed five compartments seating four and one VIP cabin in the front who paid double fare. Six more seats could be fitted if the partitions were removed. As with the previous airliners, the cabin was well furnished with a fine wood paneling over the structural elements and had specially made aluminum and leather chairs for the passengers. The decor was fairly subdued compared to the more lavish furnishing of past DALAG airships, as years of wartime hardships instilled more austere tastes. Aft of the passenger compartment was a buffet staffed with an attendant who prepared meals with an electric hot plate. The last gondola compartment contained the restroom with a specially designed commode with aluminum fittings. Flights typically lasted 7 or 8 hours on its typical Friedrichshafen Berlin route. Owing to the short nature of the flights, the airship was crewed by roughly a dozen men. When DALAG resumed service in the autumn of 1919, they began operating on fixed scheduling, which was made possible owing to Bodensee's reliability and ability to fly through rain and wind. The sightseeing flights were done away with and replaced with a regular passenger route which ran from Friedrichshafen to Berlin with a stop in Munich. The lax margins for luggage that existed in the pre-war DALAG were also done away with, with expensive fees being added after 13 kilograms. On one occasion, a woman wearing extravagant furs brought nearly a dozen trunk support and tried to protest the penalty fees, which greatly exceeded that of the original ticket. Overall, Budense proved very effective, earning 500,000 marks in its first month, placing it on the route for long-term profitability. Typical passengers were state officials, Zeppelin company personnel, and foreign visitors who could not depend on the rail network which had been racked by strikes, coal shortages, and damaged infrastructure. 1919 was a chaotic year, as mass strikes of workers and mutineers from the army and navy launched a short-lived revolution in Germany after the emperor fled and his government collapsed. Eckener saw this route as only the beginning and traveled with the airship to Stockholm, Sweden in October. There, he received an enthusiastic reception where he sold tickets for flights on the yet-to-be-completed LZ-121 Nordstern, an improved model of the Bodensee. This was to be just the start, for the real destination for these airships was Spain. In the long term, however, his hope was in crossing the Atlantic with a specially designed airship. With long-term plans seeming coming to fruition, DALAK completed the season's operations in December having flown on 88 out of 98 days for 532 hours, over 51,981 kilometers, and servicing 4,050 passengers. LZ-120 was then placed in maintenance to be lengthened and have its control surfaces altered to compensate for its oversensitive yaw characteristic. However, these plans were not to be, as the loophole that allowed these operations was closed. The Allied Commission had ruled in January of 1920 that DALAG was not authorized to fly airships under the Versailles Treaty, and they were instructed to turn their two airships over to France and Italy, who were to have received German Navy Zeppelins that had been destroyed by their crews before the transfer could take place. Dr. Eckner would claim this was a protectionist ruling, given that the Allied Commissioner, Air Commodore Masterman, was also in charge of Britain's own airship program. In any case, Nordstern was christened Mediterranee in French service and subsequently dismantled after a year of operations. Bodensee, however, would spend many years in Italian service as the Esperia. While it never returned to regular passenger service, it made flights from time to time at numerous civil and military events from its shed in Ciampino near Rome. 
Most notably, it accompanied the Polar Exploration Airship N1 as it traveled to Barcelona, Spain. It later flew from Rome to Tripoli and back in 24 hours and was shown to Japanese Crown Prince Hirohito during his visit in 1921. While most reparation airships were neglected and dismantled in the years following the Great War, Asperia seems to have been well maintained until it was decommissioned on July 18, 1928. Back in Germany, the loss of potency did little to dim Dr. Eckener's hopes. Before long, he would build an airship to cross the Atlantic, one destined for service in America. While he waited for the provisions against airships in his own country to slacken, he would bide his time and build the soon-to-be rechristened USS Los Angeles for the US Navy before he would go on to build his transatlantic airliner. Few airliners could ever boast of the eccentric career of the potency, an airship built from surplus material of the Great War and far outstripping all built before it in performance. It would go on to prove the viability of air travel operating on a fixed schedule which took into account maintenance cycles, weather, and passenger surges to create what was, in many ways, the future of air travel. It transformed DALAG briefly from a service which served pleasure seekers and sightseers to one that government officials and businessmen could rely on. With that, we end our look at this short-lived but groundbreaking little airship. Thanks for watching, and should you wish to learn more about other Zeppelin projects, visit our site to see their development from their first experiments over the Bodensee to their world-spanning flights.